Tomorrow, according to some people and maybe to some of your employers, is Columbus Day. Many other people suggest that the day is better spent honoring American Indian people who called this continent home thousands of years before Europeans arrived. For them, tomorrow is Indigenous Peoples Day. On the way in this morning, someone asked me to define this word indigenous, and I realized that I hadn't in this whole worship service. Indigenous means basically something that is local, something that comes of the land and has been there for a very long time. So we might think of indigenous plants that are local to our Southern California area or indigenous people that were here originally. So a lot of folks are still invested in celebrating Columbus Day. That attachment is, I think, a deep desire to hold on to a beloved story, a myth about how Europeans first arrived here. Does it really harm anyone if Columbus lives on as this sort of cultural hero of sorts? Even if we all know he's kind of a bad guy? Well, myth is pretty powerful stuff. Here in religious community, we're kind of in the business of myth and metaphor. We know, or at least I know, that the stories through which we understand our world, the stories of what actions are noble and what types of people are good, can deeply impact our lives. That's what religion is all about, after all, trying to come up with some symbols and words to make sense of this great big mystery of existence. Myth and metaphor can help us understand our world. But there's a big difference between a myth and a lie. A myth is something that points to a larger truth that squares with our experience. A lie is something that we tell ourselves to look better or to make us feel better. The danger of a lie of mythical proportion, a lie like the story of Christopher Columbus, is that we can really distort our understanding of the world. Columbus didn't really set sail to prove that the earth was round. By 1492, a lot of educated Europeans already knew that. And he wasn't just a curious sailor. After he landed, his governance was brutal. The islanders, the native islanders who were enslaved, if they didn't collect enough gold, would have their hands cut off. Any fellow Spaniards that rebelled were executed by hanging. This was a tidbit that I picked up this week. Somehow, those fellow colonists got the message back to Spain, to the monarchy, and Spain sent a commissioner to arrest Columbus in August of 1500 and took him back to Spain in chains. This wasn't the end of the career, but hopefully it gives us a little better picture of what the guy was about. The Christopher Columbus of cartoons and costumes, the one that's celebrated in parades and holidays, is a lie. That lie is an affront to American Indian and indigenous people around the world. That lie of the noble white explorer spits in the face of entire societies that have been enslaved, killed, had their culture robbed, and in some cases completely annihilated. Now this movement to reimagine Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day honestly can seem like a lefty attempt at political correctness. I get that. But this isn't political correctness, it's 
about historical accuracy and an attempt to begin to acknowledge our own history of what happened in this land that we call home. Indigenous Peoples Day is a small step to honor and to empower American Indian tribes. Keith mentioned a little bit that over the centuries and up into today, one of the big complicating differences between American Indians and white colonizer culture is this question of how we own land or if we own it at all. It seems like a pretty simple question at first, but ownership, especially of land, isn't always so simple. The question is particularly on my mind right now because of tapestry. For the first time in the history of our community, we now own a small piece of property, and soon we'll call it our home. We've paid for it, we have the paperwork, but as a faith community, we still have to consider what ownership means through our core values. Most of us take ownership for granted. What's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours, and we have pieces of paper to prove it. If we disagree about it, we'll take it to court and clarify, and at the end of the day, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours. But what does that mean? Do we own it because we have power over the environment or power over other people? Do we own stuff because we exert power over the world around us and take what we want? Does our economic and physical power give us the right to ownership? Or maybe that power isn't ours alone. Maybe God decides who deserves to have more and who gets less. I know it sounds antiquated, but... Plenty of people today still believe that God rewards particular groups of people with material goods. Is that what it means for us to own stuff? Being powerful? Or God wanting us to have it? Or do certain people have more because they've worked harder to earn it? It's a slightly more complicated question, one that we might want to jump up and say, yes, yes, or no, no, to. To many people, to many of you, you've worked your butts off to make a dime. And you've succeeded at that. It's also true that many people have worked their butts off simply to put food on the table for their families. Usually, those people are able to make it through. Sometimes they aren't, though. Our world is full of incredibly hard-working people that struggle to make ends meet. So by what right do we own what we own? Perhaps working, even earning our money, doesn't quite lead to a solid sense of ownership. So I invite you to consider a different kind of ownership. It's more like trusteeship. There was a saying in my head as I wrote this. I finally had to look it up. It turns out it's from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. Those who are more fortunate have an obligation to take their good fortune into account when they relate to others. That's not a message of guilt. Money, I don't think, it's the root of all evil. I'm not asking you to give away your worldly possessions. And I've been involved in this building project for at least two years now. We are not giving it away. I'm just offering a potential answer to this question. What does it mean to own that property? 
perhaps we can best see ourselves as trustees of the resources. Perhaps ownership doesn't just give us the right to use the space as we choose. So I was talking with a friend this week about this sense of property ownership. He said it had always bothered him as well. It's partially because he moved around a lot as a young person, but also because we never really own our property. It's not like we can do whatever we want on it. A good portion of us who call ourselves homeowners have only paid for a small portion of our homes. Really, the bank owns it. And even if we have fully paid for it, there's property tax and HOAs. These aren't optional services either. These are required. Even in the most remote areas of the United States that are super deregulated, there are still rules and laws about what you can do on your own land because it might impact other people. We seem to understand that ownership is mitigated by our relationship with other human people. We follow some rules because what we do affects other people. American Indian traditions, though, invite us to radically expand that sense of responsibility in ownership of land. You've almost certainly heard of the concept of seven generations, right? We have a responsibility not just to the people we know, but to the coming seven generations of our community. That's a pretty challenging responsibility. The expanded sense of relationship doesn't just cross time, though. It also transcends human relationships. Perhaps the most important lesson we can learn from American Indian people today is that we also have a relationship, a responsibility to the earth and her creatures. And that responsibility increases exponentially when we claim to own a piece of the earth. Across the United States, we know and we abide by the fact that land ownership comes with responsibility to our human neighbors. I wonder today what would happen if that sense of responsibility expanded beyond our human neighbors to include other creatures or our relationship with the earth herself. Indigenous Peoples Day, strangely, isn't a holiday that's well established with traditions. Maybe I should say it's not a hallmark holiday with a prescribed shopping list for us. So this week, I came up with a few short suggestions about ways you might celebrate tomorrow. The first thing on that list was to learn a little bit about the people who once lived in the area that you call home. So I did a little bit of research. It turns out Tapestry's new building and the entire town of Lake Forest sits in the border between two tribes. To the north is the Tongva tribe and to the south is the Ahakaman tribe. You may not have heard of either of those names. The Tongva to the north are better known as the Gabrieleño, a name derived from the Spanish mission built on their territory. And to the south, the Ahakaman are better known as the Juanino tribe, named for the mission San Juan Capistrano. That sliver of information, how we know and identify these groups of people, not by their chosen name, but by the names of Catholic missions placed on their land, speaks volumes about how they've been understood. The Ahakaman 
understood their territory to be from sort of northern San Diego County up to Aliso Creek. Throughout the territory, there were several villages that were usually around 35 to 300 people, and each of those villages was politically independent and had its own sort of resource area. But they came together to trade and for religious rituals. And to our north, in the L.A. Basin, spread all the way down to Laguna Beach, was the Tongva tribe. Their territory covered about 4,000 square miles. And when Europeans first made contact, they guessed that there were five to 10,000 people in that area. As a hunter-gatherer society, the Tongva traded widely with their neighbors throughout the area. Today, around 1,700 people identify themselves as members of the Tongva or Gabrielino tribe, but they don't have a central government or a central tribe that they all claim to be a part of. This internal division has arisen among them about whether or not to exercise their right to build and operate casinos. Now, one thing that I wanted to mention before I wrap up in telling about these tribes is that American Indians aren't folklore, and they aren't just history. They're still living and struggling to make a life in this colonized world. To this day, both these tribes struggle to protect the land that has been sacred to their people. And along with other tribes that span the continent, they're pleading with the rest of us to take our responsibilities to the earth seriously. That's a very, very slim down bit of information to give. But a little simple research unlocks a whole trove of information about the folks who first called this place home. So tomorrow, for Indigenous Peoples Day, maybe you want to look a little farther for yourself. Or here are a few other possibilities for honoring the day. Go beyond learning and support the advocacy efforts of American Indian tribes with your action or your money, perhaps. Educate children that are in your life about the people who first called this place home. Enjoy visual art or literature or dance or music by indigenous artists. Shop from American Indian-owned businesses. It's actually pretty easy to do online if you look for it. My final suggestion is a little bit simpler, but it still takes an effort, and that is to attend to your spiritual relationship with the earth and her creatures. It could mean a little meditation or prayer or just spending some time outdoors. Now, we know that celebrating Mother's Day doesn't mean that you get to be an ungrateful jerk the rest of the year. And giving gifts at Christmas doesn't mean that we're done with generosity for 364 days. Similarly, Indigenous Peoples Day is, or it can be, a step toward deeper and ongoing relationships. I invite you to take the opportunity of tomorrow to honor the people who first called this home. Honor the creatures who also still call this home. And honor the earth, for without her nurturing, none of us would have a home. Amen.